Hi, everyone. I'm Bill Squadron, president of our energy policy, and welcome to our webinar today. And we are extremely excited about the conversation uh, that you will be um, listening to in just a couple of minutes. Uh, we're so privileged to have Tim Cauley, president and CEO of Con Edison, uh, in a one-on-one -on -one with Julie Tig from the New York League of Conservation Voters, talking about the important, really quintessential challenges facing um, utilities uh, all over the country uh, as we um, address the clean energy transition. So we will get to that in just a second. First of all, thanks to all of you for joining us today. I do want to remind you that toward the second half of the hour, uh, we will open it up to questions from all of you. There is a tab on the dashboard on your right, which will allow you to type in questions. We will get to as many as we possibly can. Um, and so please uh, submit your questions and we will get to them uh, the second part of the hour. Um, the other thing I'd like to do is thank all of our partners. Uh, we are um, very grateful for the support of a terrific mix of organizations from all over the country that are committed to our um, mission of encouraging and welcoming perspectives from all corners of the energy sector on a nonpartisan basis. And so what we do is really create an environment where serious civil discussion can take place uh, on energy policy issues across the board. And we are indebted to our partners for um, supporting that. And I'd like to welcome our most recent partner, the Edison Electric Institute, and really welcome their support. And finally, um, and last but certainly not least, um, my co-host today and our um, uh, very strong supporter, US Grid, we are um, very privileged to have um, one of our board members and the CEO of US Grid, Jay Warren Klein, um, here to say a few remarks and introduce our speakers. Jay? Thank you very much, Bill. And it's a great pleasure to be here today, to be a part of participating in a conversation with Timothy Cauley, the new CEO of Con Edison, um, and and to have the honor of introducing Julie Tai, who will be moderating the session and who is a, an extraordinarily, perhaps one of the New York State's most effective and trusted environmental leaders. And Julie was named president of the New York League of Conservation Voters in 2018, having served a very distinguished career in the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, first as um, assistant commissioner for intergovernmental and legislative affairs, and then serving as chief of staff. Julie's played a key role in many of the critical legislative and executive initiatives in New York State related to clean energy and infrastructure. So Julie, it's a pleasure to introduce you and I hand it over to you. Jay, thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. I'm looking forward to the day that we, in all, we can all meet again in person. Um, I don't know about you all, but I am so ready to like see people live in real, real, real life again. It's, it's um, been in quite a year, but Zoom has certainly made this all much more accessible. And I'm delighted to be part of this conversation and introducing our main speaker, Tim Cauley. Um, in January of this year, Tim Cauley became Con Ed's president and chief executive officer. He was appointed president of the Consolidated Edison Company of New York in 2018, just a year after Con Ed was honored by NYLCV at our 20, 2017 gala. Um, prior to those positions, he served as president and chief executive officer of Orange and Rockland Utilities. Um, since joining the company in 1987, Cauley served as senior vice president of central operations with responsibilities for steam and electric generation, transmission and substation operations and construction activities. So just a few small responsibilities there. Um, he's also held a leadership operations in electric operations um, and holds an MBA from NYU and a BS in electrical engineering from Union College, which is very close to Albany where I spent way, way, way part of much of my career. Um, and after many years of commitment to energy innovation, under Tim's leadership, Con Edison earned a listing on the Smart Electric Power Alliances or SEPA's 2021 Utility Transformation Leaderboard. So Tim, welcome, welcome. Julie, thanks so much. And Bill and Jay, um, thanks for pulling this together. Really looking forward to the discussion. 
So um, I'm going to start a little local, uh, but allow you to sort of go go wide with this as we go on. And I have way more questions that we'll have time for, but I will try. <laughs> um, so here in New York, we've adopted the most ambitious climate and clean energy goals in the country. The goal of 70% renewable energy by 2030, 100% clean energy by 2040, and 85% emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction by 2050, much of which will rely on increased electrification. Obviously, we're now seeing the federal government is, is engaging on this as well. We're hoping some of this work will happen at the federal level, and, and President Biden has recommitted to some of these endeavors just this week. Um, what, what does your resource look right now? Like, what does your mix look right now, both here in New York and nationally? And do you see big changes on the horizon for your resource mix? I do, and I'll cover it nationally and then locally. Um, you know, there are incredibly ambitious goals in New York State. Uh, we think at Con Edison, we are uniquely positioned to help lead the transition to this clean energy future, and uh, our team is really excited about it. So I'll start nationally, Julie. One of our businesses is our clean energy business. So we have a regulated utilities kind of New York. That's how most people know us, the five boroughs in Westchester. We have Orange and Rockland Utilities, which is northwest of the city in the suburbs. And then we have a clean energy business. And we are currently the second largest solar producer in North America and the seventh largest in the world. That surprises many folks. We're in 20 states. So for the power we generate, we're about 70% emissions free. The balance is really natural gas fueled for our steam system in Manhattan. And that steam system is cogeneration, which is really, really efficient. Um, locally in New York State, you talked about the ambitious goals, and they are ambitious, and we want to help uh, the state get there. Um, so currently, about 25% of generation is renewables. And if you break that 25% down a little bit more, virtually all of it is hydro that has existed for many years. So we've moved the needle a little bit in New York State on solar and wind, but much more to go. 70 by 30 means we have to cover about 55% in the next eight and a half years, incredibly ambitious goals. We're looking at 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind, 6,000 megawatts of solar, 3,000 megawatts of storage. So we've got lots of work to do, uh, and we think we're here to help it. Interestingly, notwithstanding the fact that we are the second largest solar producer in North America and we're in 20 states, we are not in New York State. And that goes back to a rule during deregulation in 2000 when we were required to sell our plants. So we continue to make a strong pitch that we should be able to own in New York State for two reasons primarily, uh, Julie. The first is it benefits our customers. That's our true north. And we believe when we do the math, uh, customers will save if we own the generation as a regulated asset. Effectively, the savings come through um, the tail end of this. Rather than signing a 20-year purchase power agreement, those assets will produce megawatts for 30 years plus. And so the customer benefits for the full life of those assets. And the other reason is that, um, frankly, we're good at it. And at the pace of renewable generation that's required in New York State to hit the goals, we think it's all hands on deck and we should be one of those hands. So what what planning changes are you guys making to accommodate the fact that we have all this these changes coming or what are you doing to enable a, a cleaner grid yeah so um a number of planning changes i'll hit on a few the first is uh one of the big functions that we perform is forecasting demand so that we can build our systems and the capacity to meet the demand and we're getting much more granular in our forecast to include things like energy efficiency demand response ev charging uh, heating electrification going out two years, five years, 10 years, and the grid will change significantly because of that more granular forecasting. Um, we also consider non-wire solutions. So rather than add capacity to our system, we see if we can shave the peak with demand response and energy efficiency. And that's the first stop our engineers make before they plan an infrastructure project. Can we eliminate the need for the new capacity? And the third is we're really, from a planning perspective, both in the medium long-term planning for climate change. So a lot of what we'll talk about today, I think, is to mitigate climate change and reduce emissions, but we have to deal with what we've got. And we are seeing, we work with Columbia University on the first ever climate change vulnerability study, and then we follow that with an implementation plan. And it really looks at, in our region, what climate will do uh, and how will it impact our energy delivery systems. So for example, we will have more days over 90 degrees in 10 years than we do today. We'll have more frequent heat waves and longer heat waves. We're going to see sea level rise. So when we build equipment, we have to make sure 
it's out of the way of, uh, of the tide's harm. On the heat issue, we really, heating is the capacity limiter for our equipment. So we like to let our equipment cool at night. And then when the demand comes up, it heats up and then has a chance to cool. If you have longer heat waves, those cooling cycles eventually catch up to the equipment. So we have to incorporate that into the sizing of our equipment as we move out in time. So uh, we'll continue to refine this climate change vulnerability study um, and work it into our plans. Just following up on, on that, I'm thinking about, you talked about like more cooler days and you've alluded to like the building electrification piece of this. Um, well, how do you see, and, uh, how do you see the demand changing? I mean, demand is going to change, right? We're talking about electrifying a lot of stuff, and we're talking about potentially moving peak season from summer to winter, um, or yeah. having two having two peaks, perhaps. Um, so, how how do you see that working, and how are you guys planning for that? Yeah, and we are planning for it, and it'll evolve over time. But Julie, you've hit it on the head. In order to meet the ambitious goals that our customers want, and society is driving for, and frankly, we think we can lead really have to hit three sectors, uh, transportation, electrification of transportation. We've got to um, electric or, or uh, go with emissions-free generation, and that's the renewables we talked about. And lastly, buildings, and that's really heating and hot water, and much of that will go to electrification. So we do see a point at which right now we peak in the summer when the air conditioners crank up in New York City. Eventually, as more and more transportation is electrified, and more and more buildings are electrified, we will see that peak change. So, um, you know, it depends on the pace, but in 15 or 20 years, we could be a winter peaking utility. And we'll have to invest over time to ensure that our electric system is there and capable to meet those new demands. We'll also look at rate design. So for example, at five o'clock, if everybody came home to charge their EV, it's really gonna stress the grid. But if we can incentivize folks through tariffs to charge at night when there's a plenty of capacity on the system that goes unused and the delivery system's ready to go, charge at night, save money, and reduce the stress on the system. That'll be good for society and frankly, good for our customers as well. Sure. Um, so building on buildings, yep. um, as, you, as you talked about, I mean, um, you know, here in, in New York and I'm sure in many cities throughout the country, the buildings are actually the number one source of pollution, even though nationally and in New York state, it's actually transportation. Um, what, what work are you doing on energy efficiency at Con Ed, and what role do you see facilities playing in implementing and achieving the goals of Local Law 97 to decarbonize the building sector? You know, we, we, we know that there is a lot of challenges associated with that, especially we just saw Albany, which is our, our capital for anyone outside of New York, um, failing to pass a bill that would have mandated, for example, high energy efficient appliances and a modern building code. So there's a there's a bunch going on with buildings. What what what's your role? What do you see Con Ed working on in, in the future? Yeah. So, so and a really important sector. And like I said, we've got to hit all three hard. We can't go deep on two and, and get there. So um our energy efficiency programs have grown. We have a really, really talented team to deploy energy efficiency. We provide incentives for um, customers to um, implement various energy efficiency uh, programs. Um, we'll invest $1.5 billion by 2025 in energy efficiency, and um, we will um, triple our investment by 2030. So a lot of work going into energy efficiency. That's really the best first answer. It's the most cost effective, it saves customers money, and it reduces emissions. So to the extent that we can improve efficiency, um, both for existing buildings and for new ones, as you, as you um, pointed to, that's really the first stop and the best stop. Um, we'll also, uh, one of the challenges will be older buildings, you really need to do deep retrofits and they can be expensive, but um, it will be necessary over time to get us there. We're also looking to, uh, in terms of local on 97, electrify heating. So we've got incentives for geothermal and air source heat pumps. They haven't taken off incredibly um, to scale in our region of the country, but uh, elsewhere in the country and in the world. They're much more prevalent. So we're trying to incentivize both develop the market of installers and allow customers and building owners to understand the technology. So we're pushing that really hard. And the last thing we're doing, Julie, is uh, we have a natural gas system, obviously, and many heat with natural gas. And even as it's uh, much cleaner than oil, we're gonna have to transition that system over the next few decades as well to achieve these goals. And so we're working with a number of top research institutions to look at whether hydrogen 
or renewable natural gas or a combination of the two could be used. So rather than flow uh, the current natural gas through our delivery system, we would flow renewable or hydrogen uh, to allow for the heating um, and avoid the emissions uh, that natural gas uh, uh, is accompanied by. Well, so speaking of that, you know, the New York City Council has proposed legislation to ban the use of gas in new construction. And I, I, to be honest with you, I haven't looked at it closely enough to see if it talks about RNG or, or you know, green hydrogen. But what, what are your thoughts in general about that approach? Yeah, so so we are supportive of the transition. We recognize it's needed. You know, I've talked about it. It's uh, it's transport, it's uh, renewable generation, and it's buildings. We've got to hit them all hard. So. Uh, we're supportive of the transition and we know that buildings need to be addressed. We also know that uh, a broad, comprehensive, well thought out approach, an integrated plan to get there over time will be the, um, the best way to get there. We've embarked on a number of initiatives to help customers um, electrify their buildings, um, use less natural gas and or move off of it. Um, uh, through efficiency and heat pumps. So we've introduced those programs. Um, it's, it's the early start. Uh, that um, that legislation is sort of being um, vetted now, I think. There'll be some exceptions for cooking and otherwise. So we'll see where it lands. But in general, um, we're supportive of the transition. We think we have some tools that can help with the transition. And we will just weigh in to make sure it's well thought out and comprehensive and considers all of the moving parts as we uh, transition this big machine that is the grid into some, doing something new in the next 20 or 30 years. Right. I'm, I'm just, I'm gonna circle back on geothermal for just a second. Do you see that happening more in the suburbs first? Um, do you think that's more likely to happen in Westchester and the Orange and Rockland um, service area before New York City? Or do you think that's just really a broader, you know, need to address, you know, people being comfortable with it, having proper installers, using big enough systems um because yeah. i think it, for individual homes it's one thing versus for you know larger buildings it's a different story absolutely and i think um the early adoption will be in single family homes with a piece of a yard and some room to put down the geothermal um and it's about getting more installers engaged when we look at the math with our incentives now if you had an oil tank and had to make a decision between natural gas uh, uh an oil tank and you had to make a decision between replacing your oil tank or going with geothermal, you're better off going with geothermal. So we're closing the gap. Natural gas is still the cheapest. And frankly, a lot of our customers want natural gas, but with the incentives we have and the education we provide to customers, um, an oil for oil transition is no longer cost effective in most cases. We think geothermal is. So we're seeing some uptick there, but it is not scaled. Um, there are advantages in sort of that quarter acre plot. You have some room to put down your drill rig, and that's what it looks like. Um, it's a tube going down and back up. There are several big institutions in New York City that have installed geothermal. St. Patrick's Cathedral did it, and it's challenging, but you can do it. Um, the Cornell campus uh, did it as well, um, and a few other customers. So it is technically viable. It is somewhat challenging, but like anything else, as um, scale gets introduced to processes, they become um, more practical, more cost effective. So I think uh, it'll likely take hold in the suburbs first, but uh, you can't rule out the city. It's a challenge though for this dense, um, uh, densely populated city that we have. Sure, so speaking of density, um, what constraints do you see on bringing clean energy, including offshore wind, into dense population centers like New York City? Like I always half jokingly say, people think they know the hottest real estate market in New York City. And I'm like, no, it's Gowanus. It's Gowanus because Gowanus is where you could bring transmission in and it doesn't need lots of infrastructure upgrades. So I'm just curious. So what what sort of things do you see as challenges? You know, I think about real estate, I think about transmission, I think about grid management. So talk about that a little yeah. bit. And, and you're right, Gowanus is a hot ticket to get a spot in the New York ISO queue. Um, and um, I think it'll be, uh, there'll be constraints there, but, you know, great challenges to overcome, and I think we will. If you think about offshore wind, Julie, 9,000 megawatts off the coast of Long Island and Manhattan, and, you know, if you, New York State's a pretty big state, we're a small strip, and that small strip in New York City and Long Island consumes about 40% of the state's energy. So, you know, very dense uh, energy uh, gobblers where we are, and it's not surprising, I'm looking, I'm at Manhattan now, 
at 14th Street, and it's dense. The buildings are high and, and, uh, and congested. So 9,000 megawatts of offshore, you're going to try to bring that in. And on a day like today, the consumption in that region is six or 7,000 megawatts. And in shoulder months, it could be as low as four or 5,000 megawatts. So what is traditional is power flowing from the north near Albany and Union College down into the city. And at certain times of the year, that offshore wind, the flow will reverse. So we've really got to change the way the, the grid operates and the complexion of the grid. Um, we envision bringing 9,000 megawatts in, not one at a time in a tail. And there's been about 4,200 megawatts awarded by NYSERDA to various parties to build that generation. And they have spots at existing substations to connect. But when we look at the, um, the balance, we really see uh, clean energy hubs, if you will. So imagine a new substation with eight ports to plug into. These are leads from the, uh, and so it's a, it's a good um, uh, tight way to take advantage of a real estate spot. You're gonna sit it on one spot, all comers will come, our engineers will plan how to get it out to the neighborhood substations and it'll be an efficient way. So um, I think the key to that constraint and to overcoming that challenge is careful integrated planning have a plan of what you're going to do with 9,000 megawatts, where are you going to land it, and how are you going to get it out into the systems uh, in one piece. And we've got a lot of people working on that now at the Public Service Commission, at the New York ISO, and at other utilities. So we'll, we'll get it right, but we've got to stick with this comprehensive integrated planning. So do you see the same thing as coming from the north? I mean, obviously, um, a lot of power, A, um, we've just shut down a lot of power that was coming into New York City um, yep. with the closure of Indian Point nuclear power plant. Um, but the NYSERDA has proposed something called Tier 4 that would uh, enable people to bring power to New York City from the north. Um, there's been, a, you know, obviously a, a plan to bring a, a line from, uh, from hydropower in Quebec. There's been a lot of interest from renewable generators within New York, and a number of providers um, have suggested that. So how, how do you see it working on that end, especially when you mentioned, you know, at some points, right, we're, we're, we're going to be able to export that wind. Um, as opposed to needing to import the power to move, move that around. Yeah, and so the grid will have to be incredibly flexible. And I think in terms of real estate constraints and system constraints, we'll, we'll design and, and work through that. Um, you know, those leads, that tier four solicitation will be typically a transmission line coming in, connecting at one spot in one of our substations. And that may entail expanding the substation, sort of another compartment, if you will. But um, we've got plans to do that and we'll be able to do it. The clean energy hubs are really there because you can't you can't continue to add one more slot. You run out of space and, and capacity, so you really need a new setup. The other thing that hub will do is, as NYSERDA solicits this generation offshore, it sort of cleans up the bidding process. A bidder can say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna make wind, put some turbines out, you know, 20 miles at sea, and I know where I have to come, so the bids will be very comparable, easy to compare, easy to. Uh, select a winner because we're coming to one spot. So I think um, it'll be good for our customers um, because it'll be the most uh, cost effective way to do it. And it'll also help speed the process because these one-off leads at existing substations uh, take time and cost money. Um, the hub is really the way to go. So do you see now next uh, BOEM, uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management has just put out the proposed notice of sale uh, for the New York bite, which we've been pushing for, and we're glad to see them moving forward on that so quickly. And we're glad to see former New York um, governor's office staffer Amanda Lefton leading that charge and continuing to press forward. So are you envisioning sort of for that next solicitation? Because obviously the, the 4,200 megawatts that the, the state has already awarded, they all have locations where they're planning on going in. So are you envisioning this sort of for the next round and for the next lease areas that are, are coming to the New York area? Yeah, so uh, there'll be a lot of discussion with policymakers. Um, we were, the, the, the state utilities were asked to make a filing, and I'll get the date wrong because time flies, six months ago or so. And, and really, uh, the filing was to answer this question. With all this renewable being coming in, 70 by 30, right, um, what does the transmission and distribution grid look like and what changes are needed? And so when we do the math, we think that the state will invest or utilities or, or private concerns will invest about $12 billion on various projects to allow the power to flow either offshore or from uh, generation centers to the north of the city into the city, uh, about 12 billion statewide, about 4 billion here. And 
some of the projects that we talk about uh, for from in Con Edison's territory include these energy hubs. And so uh, it's it's certainly on the table with um, policymakers. They understand the concept. Um, it's generally been well received, but it's, there are a number of steps to get there. But I think it would be a good approach, and that's why we've advocated for it, and that's why we filed for it in that uh, in that filing for the PSC. Understood. I, there are so many filings at the PSC right now. I can't keep track of them all. <laughs> right. It's a busy time. I think it's an exciting time as well. It it is. It is uh, an incredibly exciting time. Um, shifting gears a little bit, so what what technology is clearly going to be playing a role in how we manage all of this? I know my building in particular, you've just put in smart grids, uh, you know, smart metering. Um, I don't know how it works yet in my apartment, but I know that it's been installed. Um, but what what sort of what are you doing to facilitate the integration of of innovation and new technology? You know, by by the utilities, by the customers. Um, including sort of how to manage, like you talked about this a little bit, and we'll talk more about EVs, but you talked about like, you know, how we manage demand and flexibility in demand and what we're doing with demand response programs. Yeah, so I'll, I'll hit a few things. You know, you talked about our smart meter program, and that's, uh, that is our largest capital project in our history, um, $1.4 billion, and we'll deploy uh, almost 5 million meters um, uh, for that program. And it's got all sorts of things, uh, all sorts of benefits. It saves customers money. It alerts us when your power is out. It gives us really granular information about what's happening in the grid. And so in terms of deploying technology, I would say that in general, uh, data and visibility for our operators are the two things that come together and allow us to run things more efficiently. An example with smart meters is we are able to see, Julie, in very granular fashion, the voltage levels at the grid edge, sort of where the voltage is at the lowest. And with that real-time knowledge, we're able to lower the voltage at the substation such that even those at the edge of the grid get appropriate levels of power and voltage, so they, don't, they, they have a good experience, but we're able to cut overall consumption by 1.5%. So it's an immediate savings in bill and emissions, and it's all driven by visibility into the grid. And in some instances, we'll notice in a part of our network, um, there are certain that, that prevent us from lowering, um, uh, lowering the voltage of the substation. So we'll do a little bit of work in the field, upgrade some cables, and then we'll be able to lower it for the benefit of the whole area. So we're really taking advantage of granularity in, uh, in the smart meter data to allow us to serve our customers better, saves, saves money, saves emissions. So it's a real, real big win across the system. Um, on EVs, I talked about um, you don't want everybody charging at 5 p.m. because it puts incredible stress. So we have, um, we work with a company that has uh, basically a chip that you put into the car's diagnostic port it gives the driver all sorts of information they can download about their usage and efficiency. And it also allows us to see when they're charging and provide a rebate if they charge at the right time. So it gives the customer data that's actionable and it, it, it gives them incentive to, um, to charge when the grid is best able to. It's always able to, but um, over time, we're really going to need to steer people to charge uh, um, on the off hours. And this is a start to do it. So really leveraging technology in those ways. Well, sort of building on that, um, because as you know, I mentioned earlier, this is obviously the largest source of emissions. It's like, we, the state is already moving in this direction, right? We're a California car state. Um, speaking of air conditioning, it's just turning on. Um, uh, but we're, we're clearly moving in this direction, right? Where, the, you know, we're going to have all ZEV sales by 2035 for light duty. And then really the bigger challenge, frankly, in medium and heavy duty, which has a longer tail looking at, you know, 2045. But... Um, and it's actually the only sector that has emissions that are growing, I think. I think everywhere else are coming down. So what other opportunities do you see for, for Con Ed and other utilities to be part of, you know, helping to move in that in that way? Um, and what challenges do you see? Because we, we hear sometimes um, some bus companies, for example, I'm not thinking necessarily about Con Ed service territory, but I've heard elsewhere where it's like the, a a transit bus company will want to transition and they're competing for the amount of electricity with other users, like if you have a new development coming on board. And so they're they're told that they can't get the infrastructure that they need. So which which comes first? <laughs> yeah, and, and so uh, I, you know, this sector, I think we have incredible opportunity, particularly in New York State, across the region, uh, across the nation, but New York State, 
Um, so if you've been in New York traffic, you know there's lots of cars. Only 1% of the cars, 20,000 vehicles, are EVs today. And it's really all about range anxiety. Uh, people don't see charging stations, and they're not sure where they're going to charge, so they're reluctant to buy an EV. Um, EVs, total cost of ownership is coming down. There's more makes and models. Uh, all the manufacturers are pushing that way with really ambitious goals and objectives. So uh, tremendous growth here. On the infrastructure part, um, we're going to help solve that uh, to a large extent. We'll invest $350 million in a, in a make ready program. We call it power ready. And effectively, if you own a building, we'll subsidize or incentivize that make ready infrastructure work that you would normally have to pay for. So we will cover that cost. And your role in this deal is you've got to make your chargers publicly accessible. So you can't hide them behind your gate. So we will put the infrastructure in to support your chargers. You just have to let others use them as well. We're getting a lot of uptick on this. Uh, like I said, $350 million. It's the second largest um, EV program in the United States. And we will look to put in about 19,000 level two or plug-in chargers, slow chargers, and about 450 fast chargers, um, uh, DC fast chargers. We're getting a lot of interest in it. And so you'll see more and more charging infrastructure in our region over the next few years. And with that will come a reduction in range anxiety and an increase in vehicles. You know, you mentioned the goal. Right now there's 20,000. By 2025, New York State is, or, or our region is looking to get 250,000. So, you know, more than 10x. And uh, we're modeling the behavior internally as well. As we transition our uh, light duty fleet, we're buying EVs. Um, we, uh, our first all electric bucket truck will hit the streets of New York next year. And it's really a pilot and it's not at scale, but we want to sort of demonstrate uh, how far we can push medium and heavy duty. And a bucket truck is really iconic for us. And lastly, we're working with bus companies, um, White Plains in particular, about 20, 20% of, about 80% of those yellow buses don't move during the summer. And so what we've done is to help subsidize the cost of the more expensive EV, um, their electric buses during the school year, and during the summer when we peak, we use their battery storage to feed the grid. So it's a pilot at this stage, it's not at scale, but it's another way to help get more use out of those buses to help uh, defray the cost differential. I was gonna just bring up vehicle to grid, so you saved me that. Um, but I am wondering, are there other fleet opportunities for that? Like I'm thinking, are, you know, are there other other chances for that, especially if we're needing to do more storage? Um, how how you see that working? Um, yeah, school buses are ideal. Like we've talked about that a lot because you're right. It, it it is the cost of ownership is not the same as a transit bus that runs so frequently that they get savings on 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 those costs. Right. And we'll look at, you know, medium and uh, uh, heavy duty, less in number, but huge in emissions and a real opportunity there. So our team is now we're we're getting our feet settled on light duty and they're quickly moving to uh, medium and heavy duty. Um, certain fleets where you start in Astoria, Queens, you make your round at the end of the day, you're back. That might be ripe for it. We'll have to build out the infrastructure to allow that uh, that fleet to um charge up. There are a number of large delivery companies that are really making a push toward the last mile of electric delivery and uh, will be part of that as well. Um, you know, we have in Brooklyn, we have a, a site that we're going to make ready for chargers. So if you're a charging company owner, we'll get the infrastructure ready for you to set up a charging station in downtown Brooklyn. And we'll also put storage at the site. And what the storage does is as you talked about people competing for the, uh, for the infrastructure and the energy at a given time, the fast chargers consume a lot of energy, a high demand to get a vehicle in and out of there in 20 minutes. So the storage will sort of store up uh, at low periods on the overnight. And when the system gets stressed, it will contribute to the charging of the vehicles. So we've got that on one site on a city block that we're building out uh, in Brooklyn. And again, a uh, part pilot, but we're trying to see how this works again to encourage this clean it, clean energy transition. Yeah, we haven't talked about storage at all, <laughs> I realize. Um, and that is an interesting opportunity and challenge in and of itself. Um, so what what are you doing? Because we have significant storage um, of, you know, obligation here in New York now. And it's really with the, the um, you know, the intermittency of uh, the variability, 
think that's how we like to refer to it. The variability of renewable energy sources um, uh, requires to have some storage. So what what is Kana doing and what are the challenges there? Do we still have a fire department problem? Yeah, and I wouldn't say it's a fire department problem. I mean, we certainly have to work with the fire department. Their goal is safety and it should be. And we want to make sure that if you put these highly energy energy dense units in, in a certain part of the building that we can maintain safety. But we worked uh, really well with the fire department and have had a number of successes. So we're using storage in a couple of places, Julie. One of them is um, to supplement the grid. So rather than invest lots of money reinforcing the cable, if we're just trying to shave a few megawatts, even as storage is fairly expensive on a per unit basis in the right application, it could be cheaper than the alternative. So in Staten Island, we're putting it, um, and at Nevin Street, uh, Brooklyn, uh, is, is where we're doing it with the EV chargers. We're also partnered with um, a company, 174 Power Global. We will um, install with that, with that company the largest storage facility in New York State. This will be in Astoria, Queens. And ironically, that storage, those containers of batteries, will sit at the site of a retired fossil power gen unit. So it's a, a bit ironic. Um, it'll be 100 megawatts uh, in, in service in a few years. And effectively, we've leased the batteries from this company and we will um, uh, dispatch the power through the New York ISO and the revenues we get through that dispatch will offset the cost of the lease. So in part, um, the economics of storage are still a bit challenged and this helps facilitate storage that we'll need. And again, once the market grows, um, it'll get to scale, get cheaper. Um, there'll be more uh, players in the space. And so we will, uh, we're, we're partners in the, in the largest. And the other thing we're doing is um, we've got some mobile storage. So if we need spot energy, we can roll it up like a generator and cover the peak periods um, if uh, pieces of the grid uh, require support um, for any number of reasons. Sure. Sounds like Queens to me, but um, <laughs> um, we don't know that right now. <laughs> um, I, I do think it's interesting. I actually don't think it's ironic. I think it's completely appropriate, by the way, to be reusing those energy sites because there's a lot of infrastructure already there. And so to me, it, it's much preferable, of course, to reuse those than to go on any green fields. Not that there's many green fields in New York City, but um, just in general, um, reusing the infrastructure at, at old fossil plants makes a lot of sense to me to the extent that you can while getting rid of the pollution. Um, so I'm gonna shift gears. Um, I have two, two more things before we kick it over all the questions. Um, one is, you know, we are very excited that Washington DC has finally decided to acknowledge that climate change is real and then we can do something about it. We have a lot of opportunities with clean energy. The groups like the League of Conservation Voters are, are pushing really hard for the American Jobs Plan to include clean energy, including building out EV infrastructure, EV mass transit and school buses and um, making sure that we're investing in, in clean energy and clean energy standard even at the, at the federal level. Um, what, while others are very reluctant to include energy at all, um, even perhaps maybe transmission, but they're not so sure. What, what are your views on what Washington should be doing? Yeah, so I would say include it in a big way with an exclamation point. Um, you know, our energy systems are critical components of our infrastructure. And, you know, unfortunately you notice how critical they are when they don't serve. So if you look at California at times, and even Texas this winter, um, the economic and health and safety implications of uh, infrastructure in the energy space that doesn't serve is uh, really uh, critical. And, and to me, um, two pieces of policy come together so beautifully here. We're looking to create jobs and spur the economy, and we have this critical need to transition our energy systems to a clean energy future. So it's sort of a two for one. If you're putting money into energy infrastructure, you're really knocking off two policy goals. You're creating long-term jobs that are high paying jobs in the renewable space. So um, we are a huge proponents of uh, including it in any of those plans because we think it's good for society and hits those two big, two big buckets. Great, frankly, I think it should be bipartisan given that when you think about where they're doing the most solar, it's not in the Northeast. When they're doing the most onshore wind, Again, not in the Northeast, not in the West Coast. It's in the middle of the country. Um, so it's not really, a, it should be a bipartisan issue. Um, so 
I imagine that much like government, where I spent much of my career, that Con Ed's probably a big bureaucratic organization um, where people don't like change, um, which of course we're looking at recentering our economy around clean energy. And so it's gonna require change by necessity. Um, so what things are you trying to do as a, you know, to change the culture within your company and how are you making clean a core part of your business and your mission? Yeah. And so I would, you know, at, at the head, you said sort of big and bureaucratic. I've been in the company over 34 years. So I've been sort of been there, done that, and I continue to grow every day. We have evolved incredibly in, in a, such a positive way over those years. And I think we're in a good place. I would say, Julie, that there's, it doesn't take a lot of me to change the culture. Um, our employees embrace it, frankly. Um, so you can imagine at Con Edison, there are a lot of hotshot engineers who are sort of gadgety and gidgety and, and technical. And when they get to get involved with battery storage and smart meters and, and new energy efficiency schemes, they really get excited about it. I think our uh, at the heart of our employee is a desire to serve our customers and this is what our customers want. And then frankly, people feel good about doing good for the earth. And we think in New York City, we have a real opportunity to be leaders in that space. So when I uh, have employee forums and we meet with employees, they are they sort of lean into this discussion and are engaged and interested and want to be part of it. Um, so I think culturally, um, our people are behind it for those reasons. And you know, we sort of have a um, an overarching theme. We have a, a very strong clean energy commitment. You know, we we focus on safety operations excellence, the customer experience, and this clean energy commitment, along with diversity, equity, inclusion. And the clean energy commitment looks at emissions-free electricity, all in on EVs, um, energy efficiency, storage, all of those components. Frankly, for our business and our business model, it is our way forward. This is where we're gonna make our mark as a su successful company. We've been serving this great region for almost 200 years. And so this next few decades will be marked by our Con Ed of New York's and Orange and Rockland and our clean energy business and our transmission business, our transition to this clean energy future. That's what's going to mark the next few decades for us. We know that's our path forward. And so um, to the extent that certain change culturally is hard, our team has rallied around this and um, feel good about it. And um, we recognize it's our path forward and we feel really good about that path. Apologies for interrupting here. Um, we do want to move to Q&A. This is Kevin with Our Energy Policy. Um, perfect time to transition. I would like to invite back to the stage here, Jacob Warren Klein, our co-host, who would like to ask the uh, first question. Jay? Well, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Tim, for those outstanding remarks. You focused in one part of your remarks on the need to um, transition mobility to electricity and some of the very exciting initiatives you're taking. Is your transmission and distribution system adequate to the task as we think about getting to a stage where the bulk of our transportation of both cars, buses, and trucks, et cetera, are electrified and looking at the scope of your system, how do you get it to, your, uh, to the edges of the system where you might have a lot of the depots that are involved? And I'm thinking particularly about the Public Service Commission having turned down what I thought was a modest request by Con Ed a couple of years ago for some increase in transmission and distribution investment authority and I'm wondering how you're thinking about making this happen. Yeah, re really good question, Jay. And it's top of mind for us. And I would say transport and electrification of heating will add a tremendous demand to the right. system. And, and so um, you know, I mentioned, you know, uh, Julie asked, what are you thinking about in terms of planning? We are much more granular and specific about including line items for EVs and building heating into our forecasts over the years. So it won't happen overnight, but we can't build this stuff overnight either. So um, we're going to carefully plan it. The other thing with EVs, um, the most successful deployments at scale for EVs include some level of um, time of use uh, rates where you can encourage folks to charge. So if, if you park in a garage, if you're in the outer boroughs or in Westchester or in Orange and Rockland, you might set a timer and say, come on at, at midnight and charge through 5 a.m. Our systems will have a lot of room for a lot of years at that time of day. So effectively, we're getting greater use out of the existing system to get them to charge there. So time of use charging for EV. But in general, um, we work with policymakers to ensure that we have sufficient capacity 
um, to meet these demands and electrification is the path forward and we'll need to build out our, um, our, our transmission and distribution systems to meet it over the over five years, 10 years and 20 years. Time. So we'll be able to keep up with it, um, but it'll take a good integrated plan to do so. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, moving on to our next question here, which is from Craig Bettenhausen. What roles do carbon capture and nuclear power play in your decarbonization plans? And let's extend that a little bit and see, you know, what would you see in store, you know, for their role in the industry as a whole? So in, in terms of carbon capture, that's one of the technologies that is being looked at um, when we look at low carbon, uh, our low carbon resource initiative. So I would say that goes hand in hand with uh, hydrogen production and transport. Um, as well as renewable natural gas, those types of solutions aren't at scale yet and are not yet economic, but there's a lot of effort and smart minds and resources dedicated to moving those, uh, those technologies forward. So um, right now, all of that is on the table for us, and we don't need to solve all of it in the next five years, but we've got to pursue a path where some or all of those become uh, a component of the overall integrated plan. With regard to nuclear, um, there is some nuclear in New York State, and uh, as Julie alluded to um, most recently, Indian Point closed in Westchester. Um, before the announced closure of Indian Point, uh, we had done some studies with the New York ISO and other utilities and the Public Service Commission to make sure that the reliability hung in there um, without those megawatts in Buchanan, New York. And we, um, we implemented a few transmission projects that moved power into the region. So from a reliability standpoint, we're okay. And all of the goal setting New York State has considered, uh, had uh, incorporated the retirement of Indian Point. So the 70 by 30 path uh, understood that we'd lose that emissions free generation and um, we're on the path uh, notwithstanding that. So I think uh, we have to continue to advance in all types of technology to sort of close the gap between what is um, doable now and what will need to be accomplished by 2050. Great, thank you very much. Uh, next question here is from Nancy Nigerian. How can citizens partner with utilities to move them faster towards using clean energy? So uh, there's, there's a few things you can do. Um, if you have a home that allows for uh, solar installation, we have tremendous uptick in rooftop solar. I think 47,000 of our customers have installed rooftop solar um, and about, I'll get it wrong, but about 400 megawatts worth. And the megawatts are important. You know, our peak is 13,000. So 400 is meaningful. But to me, uh, what's more impressive is the broad interest by our customer base in actually doing this 47,000 times across our service territory. We put solar on the rooftop of the building I'm in at Fort Irving, and it does not power the building, but it does contribute, and it really allowed us to see what a customer experiences in the, um, in the connect process um, for a building rooftop. We've gone far and wide. We've gone to NYCHA buildings, uh, installed solar with some partners on NYCHA buildings. And that program is really important because some of those communities are underserved as we transition to this clean energy future. And um, so the program takes advantage of uh, NYCHA roofs. The installers are NYCHA residents who train for this profession. So they get a pathway to these really great careers. And the third prong of this is um, low and moderate income residents in New York City can apply to the community solar that gets produced, save about $100 a year, but importantly, participate in the transition. If you live in an apartment and are low and moderate, it's hard to participate in a meaningful way. So that's a program that allows people to participate. I would say uh, go to our website. We have lots of energy efficiency tips and lots of energy efficiency incentives that you, you could and should take advantage of. Great, thank you. Uh, next question here, what is the role of microgrids going forward? That is their role in terms of avoiding major outages, facilitating green energy, reducing emissions and economic development. Yeah, I think, um, you know, with microgrids, it's um, if it's at the right spot under the right set of circumstances can be really valuable. Certainly from a resiliency play, they can be valuable. One of the things we've done with our grid really post Superstorm Sandy is um, implement devices and switches that allow us to 
sort of uh, portion off low-lying areas um, so we can isolate those without isolating large uh, pieces of neighborhoods um, in the event of really uh, lousy weather and flood conditions. But I think microgrids can contribute. Um, in terms of emissions, it depends what's, uh, what's fueling the microgrid. Solar with battery backup uh, is a really good source of emissions reduction. Some other fuels might not be as um, uh, productive from an emissions reduction standpoint. So I would say um, um, microgrid serve a role, particularly from a resiliency standpoint, and um, there's got to be a right fit uh, for the conditions and the demand and the use uh, for them to make a lot of sense. But there are places where they do, in fact, make a lot of sense. Great, thank you. Uh, next question here is from John Perkins. Um, regarding the move within the industry to net zero and net zero plans, uh, has the aspiration for these plans affected stock prices or investment patterns across the industry? So I would say, you know, affect stock prices, that, that's a little bit short term for net zero. But I would say that um, investors in general and the money that follows investors are much more cleanly fo clearly focused on ESG than they were in previous. When I meet with analysts, it's a question that comes up uh, quite frequently. We do an ESG day for investors. Uh, I think it'll be in August this year to really share what we're doing uh, on the environmental front, the governance front and the social front. We think um, we've got really good programs in place and we're focused on doing even more and sharing even more. Um, so uh, I think uh, there's increased focus by the investment community on um, ESG and the E in ESG. So uh, in general, I think that ties to your question would be a yes. Certainly, thank you. <clears throat> From Eduardo Guerra, in the context of net zero by 2050, what is the role of green hydrogen within Con Edison's energy strategy to decarbonize? How could private companies support Con Edison's goals? Yeah, really great question. And I would say green hydrogen is squarely on the table. There are, you know, um, we're in 2020 now, or 2021, 2050 is 30 years out. And one of the things I remind myself is, where were we all in 1990? That was 30 years ago. And the world has progressed incredibly in those 30 years. And we're going to need significant progression to close the gap to get to net zero. And um, the way we think about it uh, at Con Edison and in industry in general is um, we really want to um, avail ourselves to any opportunity to close that final gap. So green hydrogen is one of them. In the last year or so, I have seen more investment in green hydrogen technology and deployment and piloting than in the prior 20 years. So it's not here yet, but it could be a really important ingredient to closing that last piece you know, you can get to a certain point and some of it's low hanging, some is medium hanging, medium hanging, and then the end is really tough to get. And, and green hydrogen might be a piece on the really tough to get part. Just to go back, 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind, if we're only going to use 5,000 at certain times, could you take that 4,000 megawatts and make uh, green hydrogen out of water with all that sort of spare electricity and store the energy as hydrogen? Those are the kind of, the kind of concepts we think about and we're involved with a number of research institutes to help push green hydrogen forward. Thanks. Well, and I think it's interesting is that it's like you have a lot of different opportunities to use green hydrogen, right? There's obviously opportunities for, for from the power perspective, there's opportunities from the transportation perspective, there's opportunities for frankly manufacturing, which is probably the hardest thing to decarbonize overall, some of the some of the manufacturing we have. I'm not as familiar with in, in New York City, but certainly in upstate New York, there are challenges with especially energy intensive trade exposed industries, which I didn't even know what EITE stood for before the CLCPA was adopted. <laughs> so yeah. it, is, it is an interesting opportunity and something, you know, I think, can, you know, can and should has play a role somewhere in the decarbonization sector. That's right. And, and it could be in our natural gas system, we'll move different molecules. It could be for long haul transport on trucks. It could be to fuel generation, uh, given the intermittency of renewables. So really it's about getting that technology to scale and efficient and then finding the best applications for it as we go out over the next few decades. And, and I think for fuel cells, um, you're seeing plug, plug, plug Power has purchased a company to make green hydrogen and they're actually doing that in Rochester, New York. Um, so it's very exciting opportunity and that's obviously emissions free and perhaps a, a different way of 
being a little bit cleaner in, in storage, which right now requires a lot of heavy metals. That's right. I, th I think that that's all right. And again, um, we're, there's a lot of aggressive piloting and research and development in these areas now, uh, hopefully to pay off uh, in the years to come. Great, thank you. So you mentioned renewable natural gas earlier in the presentation. Uh, we had a question here from Herschel Spector asking, how much renewable gas do you think you'll need by 2030 or 2040? And you know, what do you have in, in mind in terms of sourcing or has this been discussed at all? Yeah, and, and I would say, really good question. Um, I think it'll be one component of our solution and we'll see how deeply it develops. We're working uh, with a developer um, in uh, Southern Westchester to put some renewable natural gas in. So we'll learn about the technology, how it integrates with our natural gas system, and we'll see uh, just how effective we can be. The extent to which it contributes to the overall solution is yet to be determined. There are limits, certainly. You need the feedstock to develop the uh, renewable natural gas. Um, so there are certainly limits. But um, we think it is a, a component that we should leave on the table as we work our way toward net zero over the next uh, several decades. Thanks. I think about RNG a lot because uh, you know we talk about it for transportation. It's potentially small, but the bigger issue is we have all these waste streams that need to be managed, and so we need to capture it on the back end. You know, no matter what we do, we're going to continue to have food waste. We're going to continue to have sewage waste. New York City is uh, doing this now. At their, they're collecting food waste and they're processing their wastewater. Uh, through digesters, and they they use more more gas. They they have more gas generated there than they can use. So they're yeah. contributing back to the grid in a way that every every wastewater treatment plant should be doing that. I know, and and at the end, you still have a product that's a soil amendment. So this is something that I think really we need to be looking at the big picture. It captures you know these other waste streams that captures carbon from the you know from those. Um, and other pollution and puts it back to good use instead of treating it as garbage. Yeah, agreed. And, and I think, the, you know, in order to close that gap and get to net zero, we're going to continue to have to reach a little further and avail ourselves to additional solutions. And that might be one of them, Julie. Thanks. Exactly. Again, sort of a, a lot of different places, much like green hydrogen, lots of different potential end uses, but certainly something we should be capturing. Yeah. Well, I think we have time for just one more question here. Uh, this is from Janine Fennell. Uh, can you tell us about hiring projections for Con Ed in the clean energy space? Yes. Yeah, so, so um, you know, we have increased uh, our um, our employment in the energy efficiency demand response. Uh, that group is a really talented group, um, and as those programs grow, you know, we'll triple those by 2030. We'll spend 1.5 billion dollars by 2025. So that's a group that is growing, and and certainly um, that group also handles things like EVs and geothermal heat pumps. So that whole sector, it's a new part of our org chart that is uh, is growing, and has really um, yielded some great results. And then you know we deliver um, uh, energy to the greatest city in the world, in my mind, uh, have been doing so for a long time, and so our core business is really about safety and reliability. And so the splicers and the gas uh, uh, fitters and the technicians on our substations, we continue to hire those professionals and we'll need to do so independent of this transmission. We'll still have to deliver um, energy uh, to this great area. And uh, so uh, I would say our clean energy uh, or, or customer energy solutions section will likely grow the most, uh, but we'll have a steady um, allotment of uh, workers maintaining the core for many years to come. You know, I hate to jump in here because this has been such a terrific conversation. And your last point, Tim, about serving this area for so long, I didn't realize it was close to 200 years, which is an incredible thing to contemplate. Um, I also uh, I can tell you I'm really excited about seeing that electric bucket truck. So. Uh, that was a great thing to hear about. But but more seriously, um, thanks to both you and Julie for this terrific conversation. I think it really underscored the complexity of addressing these ambitious goals that we have and how many moving pieces there are and trying to fit that puzzle together and make it work in the time frames that we all know uh, are urgently upon us. So. Um, Thanks so much to both of you for sharing these insights on this. Um, I'd also like to thank Jay Warren Klein, US Grid, 
for co-hosting this with us and their support. Thank our partners once again for supporting this. Thank all of you out in the um, audience for taking your time, getting your questions in. And I'd like to encourage all of you to take advantage of one of our programs, the Our Energy Library, which you can find on our website and has thousands of you know, the most current and also historical reports, studies, papers, articles, and so forth on all issues of energy policy. So as you all are working on the important um, matters that you're um, contributing to this space on, hopefully we can contribute to your work through the Our Energy Library. Um, so uh, once again, everyone stay safe. Thank you for taking your time to be with us today. And uh, most of all, thanks to Tim and Julie uh, for these, uh, these insights that you've shared with us. To everybody, have a great day, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Be well. Thanks.